supposed to be we're going back to Philippines this time, this month. <laughs> this month, yeah. Yeah, we're supposed to. Okay, this is Reverend Brian Richards. My whole family Richards. day now. This is Reverend Brian Richards uh, of the Word of Faith Ministries International. When we're at home, we call ourselves Divine Connections. That's because we do weddings under that name. We're really the Word of Faith, uh, Word of Faith Christian Fellowship here locally, and then internationally with the Word of Faith Ministries International. And we have that registration. And uh, in 2013, we adopted this name, the Word of Faith Ministries, or Word of Faith Charity. And we became a registered charity. Persons holding office of the church do not necessarily hold the same powers in the office of the charity. This charity being a non-denominational institution organization and operates under the same ABN number that I use for my own personal business. That may change in time to come. Um, they just simply change the ABN number to whatever the Word of Faith charity will be. But they asked me in 2013 to get it up and running for them. And, uh, and that's why we're here now. This is our very first annual general meeting. Right? And uh, I didn't know how to have an annual general meeting because it's different to church. And I only know how to do a church. So if this seems to be a little bit religious to some people who are looking at the recording, it's because that's who I am. I am an ordained minister, but the chairman of the Word of Faith charity doesn't necessarily have to be an ordained minister like myself. It can be anybody that is nominated by the, the, the majority of the people um, who belong to the charity, and as long as they do not have a criminal record, then they can hold office in the charity. Now, the purpose of the charity was to raise funds for people in need. In particular, we, our focus uh, at, the, at, the, at this present time is uh, the people that have suffered under uh, uh, what they call it, tornado. Uh, the storms and the floods that they have in Philippines and lots of other Asian countries, they do not have what we have in Australia. Uh, and Australia as a whole, if you know any Australian looks at the news, they'll see that Australia is one of the biggest giving countries in the world to Asian countries, particularly at a time of need, uh, like floods and tornadoes, things that have lost their houses and they lost their lives sometimes and they lost their business and they have poverty. The uh, world vision, Australian world vision, uh, given many, many millions of dollars over the years to particularly to Asian countries like Philippines. I've worked with uh, World Vision, uh, worked with them under uh, Tim Costello, and uh, many times I've thought that I'd like to have my own charity, or my own team at least, that would work in with World Vision. And uh, I did things to raise funds, like wrote articles for different uh, internet companies that would advertise my articles, advertise my, my business, and advertise my ministry. 
and uh, so it worked fine for me and it worked fine for them because publishing the article uh, with other advertisers raised finances so much so that in the last uh, say in the last five years that we have donated something like uh, seven and a half thousand dollars to World Vision so that was not out of my own pocket it was money that I raised from the internet that I could have put in my own pocket but I decided to give it to World Vision and uh, so becoming a registered charity, Word of Faith charity now, has credit for that. You understand? So they have credit for that. And uh, so the purpose of starting the registration of the Word of Faith charity was so that we become tax exempt for the money that we can raise. So we've got permission to raise up to 30000 per person. I forget now exactly how much it was. Anyway, it's been increased. Started up 30,000. I think it's a lot more now. Uh, sort of like half a million that we can raise through and not pay any tax at all. But we do have to put in a report. Not to an accountant's report, not a financial report even. Just a report of what we're doing uh, what we have done last year and what we're going to do or what we see ourselves doing for next year. So our purpose of getting together as the Word of Faith charity is to have a brainstorming, which we should have already done, all of us, done a brainstorming amongst ourselves so we can say, this is what I would like to happen in 2015. Is that right? And uh, this is not me preaching, so you can speak any time you like, ask any questions any time you like. The purpose of the recording is so we do not have to write down the minutes of the meeting, okay? So we can just look at the recording and I can write down the minutes of the meeting from the recording instead of having somebody write down the minutes of the meeting and they miss the meeting themselves, you see? So we do a recording this way. And if somebody gets benefit out of my recording, that's wonderful. I was sharing, before we started the recording, I was sharing that we uh, have done, you know, you're either a, a philanthropist or not. A philanthropist is somebody who raises money, right? And you're either born that way, you know. My wife, I believe, is, is born a born philanthropist. She doesn't even know what it means. But it means that they give love gifts to people and they're led that way. You know, some people have to learn. I know I wasn't born that way. I had to learn how to give. I had to learn how to love in, in some respects. And when I was eight years old, I grew up in a place that was very, very rough. At eight years old, I learned to, I'm glad my son's not here. <laughs> but at eight years old, I learned how to street fight and to run up a wall and kick somebody in the teeth and then take his money. <laughs> if we had chocolate biscuits in the house, it's because they were stolen. I grew up like that. So do I know poverty? Yes. I grew up with, with, with extreme poverty and... Um, it's a hard thing to shake. Poverty is not the lack of something. I'll explain that poverty is the lack of God in your life, not the lack of money in your life, not the lack of food or anything else. Poverty starts in the mind and it goes right through your whole life and it becomes a poverty thinker or a free-spirited thinker or a Christian thinker. <laughs> you become born again Christian and you start to think like God, or you should do. If you become a student of the Word of God, that's 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, 
What you need is not be ashamed if you know that you've studied and you've allowed the Word of God to change the way you think, the way you feel, and change your whole life. It certainly changed mine. And I know it can change yours and it will change the world. Eventually. If we keep plugging the Word of God and not our own theologies, then things change. But nothing changes unless we change. Unless we change the way we think and the way we look at things. And one thing I have learned, that if we give thanks for everything that we've got, I mean, in, in Philippians 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. So, why does it say that when lots of times we don't feel like rejoicing, we have nothing to give thanks for, it would so it seem, but if we give thanks, even when we don't feel like it, when nothing indicates that we should be giving thanks, we just do it anyway, you guarantee it, circumstances will change. And it's like putting a protection upon you, yourself, personally, and upon everything that you own or possess or be in charge with. We're students, and we, we're just... Um, learning as we go. And one thing I, 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 I must emphasize here, and that is we don't own anything, really. We, 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 we are just, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, when you, to look after? Caretaker. Caretaker, or whatever, something else. Caretaker, but yeah, that's what it is. We are caretakers of what God has given us. Everything I own, it came by faith. <coughs> Everything. You want me to, oh yeah, okay. I don't know. Hello, hello, hello. Sometimes they get. Hello. Yeah, the recording comes out better when you've got the microphone on, because the you can't be accused of saying something you didn't say. Or uh, mumbling something that meant something else. Anyway, if we give thanks for everything that we've got, it puts a protection over what we have. And um, we just caretakers of what we have. We don't really own it if, if God owns it. And uh, so, if everything was taken away from us that we never give thanks for, what would we have left? Some people would say, well, well I don't think I'd have anything left. That's, that's a very serious thing that we should think about, and that is we'll only have left. One day it will happen. We only have left what we have given thanks for. I'll give you a scripture, a chapter, and a verse for that if you want. But it does say, In my father's house there are vessels of wood, hay, and stubble. Remember? And uh, then it says, Precious. And so, when the fire of God comes on everything, he'll just burn away the things that are not relevant to God. And we'll be left with what we give thanks for with God, what came by faith. Anything that didn't come by faith will be gone. And that will happen very, very soon. I had a vision of the fire of God, like it's just, you know. <laughs> Praise God, I don't, I don't want to preach, but I was, I, I'm going anyway. Uh, you know, the rainbow in the sky, every time you look at a rainbow in the sky, you think, well, thank God, you know, uh, that rainbow was given as a sign. 
so the world will not flood again. God's promise saying they will not flood the world again and destroy everything. So he's saying that they will not destroy the world again by flood. Didn't say it was not going to flood the world with something else. And he'd flood the world with his presence. It would be like the fire of God going through everything and it would destroy everything that is not of faith. Everything that is not of God will be destroyed and the only things that will be left are the things that are built out of faith. I really believe that time is now, that it's happening very soon. We'll see it in our lifetime. I believe Jesus will come back in, in my lifetime and so we haven't got long. Why I said all that was to say that we have a responsibility for what we know. We are responsible for the seed that God gives. I've been investigated two or three times by government departments like tax offices and things like that because they say I live above my means. And um, I suppose that's true, but I'm a person that lives by faith. I believe that you give me $100 a day, I'll turn it into 1000 and the turn 1000 into 10000 and so forth. And how I do that is not by gambling, and yet other people would say it was gambling. I do take risks. But I deliberately sow seed into where God shows me to sow it. And if I'm obedient to God in sowing seed, I can expect a harvest of blessing. That's how I live today. I don't believe that I should teach people how to tithe by, by pressure. I shouldn't use the Word of God to manipulate people to tithe. But I should use the Word of God to, to open their heart to give. The Lord says the time of sowing and reaping will never cease. That will go on forever. And... Uh, the law of sowing and reaping is what we should be living by. In other words, you will only you'll only reap what you sow. You can't expect a banana tree to be growing in the back garden if no one ever planted one, you know. But if you know it's a planted there, even if you don't see it, you just keep watering, it'll come up, you know, because the seed has been sown. And uh, but a lot of Christians today. They want to reap where they've not sown, and that's okay if they've sown somewhere else, you know, because God is the Lord of the harvest anyway. Jesus says, I am the Lord of the harvest. Uh -huh. And he says, the fields are white with snow, the like snow. And you, time of harvest, the time of reaping, and, uh, but you see, why people are not reaping is because they have not sown. And they have condemnation. People are living under the pressure of condemnation because they know they have not sown seed. Others, they've sown it unwisely. They sowed seed on ground that will never produce. I see people going to church and they give every week, they're giving it religiously, or a tithe and offering because somebody's preaching tithes and offerings to make you faithfully. And they, it, it, it's wonderful that they are faithful to what they do. But it's not done by faith. It's done under the laws. You see. And so we're not under the laws of that kind of thing. We're under the laws of love. You know? And we give because we love what you preach. We love the vision that we're involved with. We love to be a 
a partaker of the divine nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. You notice Jesus never gave to everybody that had need. He gave with compassion to those who had need. You know, and we have to give out of compassion. You know, I, I, I first time I went to Philippines. Uh, I went there with a bit of money actually, and I come back with nothing. And uh, but you know, I would have given them everything to share off me back anything. I actually did many times. And uh, you know, I would go with two or three pairs of trousers, five shirts, and so forth, and I come back with just what I stand up in. And uh, a wonderful feeling to know that you've done all you can. You know. <clears throat> anyway, praise God. Brother. But if we have everything taken away from us overnight, except for the things we give thanks for, what would we have left? I'm pleased to be able to say, well, I think I'd have most of it, you know. And uh, But I've lived that way, you know, that when we first got married, I proposed to my wife in 2000 three and I said will you marry me or no I didn't I said would you like to come to Australia he said well, have you considered going overseas we like Australia wow and I said well you know you have to marry me of course you know, that's the only way I can get you there <laughs> it was like she was struck down all of a sudden and uh, she said well I never considered I said look uh, I thought she was going to say no and I said look I, I I want you to really consider what I've said. Uh, I mean, you only just met me, you can't say you love me or anything. I don't expect that. But love will come. I said to her, love will come. And I just believe that God has spoken to my heart where you really uh, deserve to see the goodness of God and God's going to use me as a channel of blessings to, to bless you and get you to us further. And love will come. Don't worry about that. I said, I'll give you three days to think about it. <laughs> and that's true. That's true. And uh, after the second day, she rang me up and said, OK. I said, OK, what? Well, I've forgotten. I really <laughs> had. Uh, I hadn't forgotten that I asked her to marry me. But I've forgotten in the manner of what I'd said. And I don't think it was fair for me to do what I did, but it's the way I was led to do it at the time, so if I had the chance, I'd do it again because it worked. And I said, what are you saying okay to? She says, okay, okay. I said, oh, well, what are you? okay. So I hung up the phone. I said, she said, okay. That means we're having lunch, was it, or what? So we went met again for, for lunch, and I realized she was saying, yes, you're going to, Marry me, so I said. Well, look, we. <laughs> I, 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 I'll. Um, I don't want to go back to Australia. We, you know, just being engaged. I want to be married. And she said, okay. You know. I said, uh, and because you organise it, I only got to, a couple of weeks. Was it? I only got a, a short time. I said, um, we'll go into Manila. We we'll get married. All the time, I'm thinking about 15 or 17 dollars I got in my pocket. That's all I had, and uh, I'm making big plans, right? We're going to do this, we're going to do that, and uh, all I had was a plane ticket to get home. You know? Anyway, <coughs> we got uh, to Manila, and I had sent out a few emails, one to Steve Harrington. I'd never forget, as long as I live, that you, as Steve, has blessed me over the years, and I really appreciate that, Steve. Um, Steve Hangel is a, a man that uh, was one of the elders in our church at Christian Outreach Centre in Hobart. And he still lives there today, and uh, he's faithful in, uh, in any way he believes God is, is, uh, is telling him to do. And he's been faithful and mature in uh, his decisions in the Lord. And when I asked him to help me to get my wife here, he uh, he just blessed me. He just never 
allowed me to speak the end of the sentence of what the need was. You just look. And sure enough, the blessing would come into my bank account. And that day, I just sent in an email, I'm getting married, I got our money, mate, but I'm getting married. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think it was a day later, uh, there was uh, added to my bank account $500. And I sent the same email to uh, another elder of the church in uh, Hong Kong, Malaysia. She comes from Malaysia, it was in Hong Kong, that's right. So I, I just came from Hong Kong to Philippines. Usually I come from America, the USA to Philippines, but at that particular time I went to uh, Hong Kong and then Philippines, and I just left the church in Hong Kong. Uh, pastor didn't bless me at all uh, financially. I don't know what happened, but anyway, I left there, and uh, so she sent me five hundred dollars. So we got a thousand dollars now to get married. Praise God! So that's how we got married. Uh, so, so you know, and I've lived this way for many years. You know. And some people would say, well, you know, you live out of other people's pockets. But isn't that really how the, I read the Bible, that uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, that people often quote and misquote, and they miss, really, they, they, they don't say it the way it's written. And uh, I'd like to just turn to it and read it. Philippians chapter 4. And verse, uh, verse 19, we all know it. It says that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to God, our Father, and glory forever and ever. Amen. But actually, what he's actually talking about is that if you give to me, the Apostle Paul is saying very clearly, and with faith, he's saying that if you give to me into this ministry, my God is going to supply all your needs. All right? I mean, people just pull that one scripture, like pulling a rabbit out of a hat and say, God's going to, you know, God hasn't got to do anything unless you do something first. And that is sowing seed into a missionary ministry. Uh, Apostle Paul was a missionary and he says for he said that he had need and he says uh, he said that he, he had need and then he says not because I desire a gift but I desire fruit that you may abound to your account but I have all abound and am full, having received Ephrodias, Ephrodias, and the things which were sent from you, and Abdur, sweet smelling sacrifice, acceptable and well pleasing to God. He's giving thanks for the offering that he has received, saying thank you very much. And he's saying, I desire this finances to come to him, not that he need the gift, but you need to see the increase in your finances. And he's saying that if you want to increase in your finances, give to missionaries. And then he's saying, for my God shall supply all of your needs. Yeah. Consider the missionaries' needs first. My God will supply for you but consider the missionary, he's out there and he hasn't got anybody and he hasn't got a congregation that he can pay his way. But he's out there by himself pioneering something new to people who have never heard this gospel like this before. They don't know how to live by faith. But you do, and if you give to missionaries, then my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus. Amen. I wonder if it actually 
I, we sat here for one hour, the blows on the back of the neck. Of the and uh, I just want to introduce to you a another. What was we? So, has anybody got anything to say? <laughs> what you spoke was the truth, absolute truth. Because this is not a, it's not a preaching sermon as such. It's just a get together that we need to get together and, and brainstorm and uh, find out what we're going to do to to raise finances. For the coming years, one year at a time. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so, what I'd like to introduce to the many masses of people that may be listening is a concept, a vision, a plan, or a purpose of what we're going to do in 2015. When I visited uh, Jeannie up there in uh, what's the name of the place? Kelper? Kelper, Kelper, Kelper. No, right. We've got call it. Yeah, we've got to call it Kelper for now. Well, that it. is part of Grafton? Oh, yeah. it's, it's Grafton is the nearest town. Oh, uh, it's separate places. Ah, separate. And so, when I visited uh, Jeannie up there at uh, Kelper, there was a vision came to me of. Um, just like Obadiah, and that's why I wanted to get Daryl here today to talk about Obadiah because it would give you the uh, inspiration you need to believe for finances. Daryl and I, I never want Daryl, I hope you don't see <laughs> Daryl and I, we, 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 we stayed in the same church and we had the same ministry and all of that. And uh, he had a, a plan, a dream. And uh, went overseas, you know, did missionary work. And uh, it wasn't the same as the church we were attending, you understand. So, now this is, this, this is the thing, you know. Why do people start churches all the time? People ask me the same thing. And why do people go to one church and then they leave, they go to another church? And uh, usually they say, oh, you know, maybe the pastor they didn't like or whatever. And it's usually that's got nothing to do with it, or very little. Should have very little to do with it. But what should have a, a lot to do with it is the, the vision of that church, the, the, the dream, the plan, the, what they want to, the purpose of why why the functioning, why they start a different church, is not because they disagree with doctrines and all that. Sometimes that does come into it, but why I actually separated myself from the church that I was attending is not because of the doctrinal issues, even though there were some, but that was not the reason. They actually gave me the left foot of fellowship. Uh, saying that uh, I had this American thing, you know, uh, and uh, you want to Americanize the Word of God. And I said, well, you know. I said, well, look, if you're talking about the faith, you know, I like to operate by faith because two reasons. One, I never had any other choice. There was never any other choice uh, to operate by faith, live by faith, and I see in Hebrews that without faith, it's impossible to please God anyway. So, faith is what it's all about. And if you haven't got faith, you need to get some. That's right. <laughs> uh, and so, if I can't get faith in this church because they don't believe in it, 
that I find the church that does believe it. You know? And uh, if they are not meeting the needs of the people that God has given them, uh, then there's something wrong. You know? um, for instance, when I eventually did start a, a, a church, I started it completely by accident, by not going to the church where we was going, uh, bought uh, somebody a fridge. I bought them a fridge, you know. The woman uh, came and shared her heart with us one day and uh, she didn't realise it, but she was really asking God for help and I'm the one that was doing the listening and God said, buy her a fridge. So I bought her a fridge <laughs> and it, it ended up starting a church. In, in Tasmania, I went there and had a, uh, what we have, a birthday party. I wanted to give a birthday party to a school teacher. I thought it was worthy of a birthday party. I gave her a birthday party. She had lots of friends. They came. Church came out of it. You know, so, you know, you just do things in obedience to God you may not understand at the time, but that's, that's what In Philippines, Three o'clock in the morning, I give a party for the prostitutes. One of them had a birthday. And uh, all these prostitutes came from everywhere. And the rock and rollers and the black fellas and everything, you know. And we started, we had church. And, you know, when I started to sing to the Lord, they went like I could hear a pin drop, you know. Previous to that, they was... I mean, they're drinking beer in front of me and they're rocking and rolling and they, you know, they had karaoke going and everything. And I started to sing Amazing Grace. The karaoke was still growing, but I started to sing Amazing Grace. And they knew that when I sang it, it was something different about it. The words was the same, there was something different about it. And they could hear the pin drop. And after it finished, I never give time for that to another song to be going up. I started preaching straight away about giving your life to Jesus. And uh, they, another song came up and they mooted it. And that was playing and I was preaching and they give, most of them give their life to Jesus. Okay. You know? And uh, they say, what kind of minister is this bloke anyway? And it's always the sort of bloke that give a party for prostitutes three o'clock in the morning. That's what sort of bloke he is, you know. So that's what sort of man I still am. You know, I might not be, I might not orthodox. I might not be what you're looking for. But that's who God made me. And, uh, you know. Hasn't changed. You know, you don't quit dancing when you come to Jesus. You just change partners. Amen. Absolutely. I'll say that again. <laughs> you don't quit dancing when you come to Jesus. You just change partners. You know, in other words, God will use the personality that you are to to for Him. He doesn't want to make you something else. You don't have to pretend to be somebody else, to be a minister. You don't have to be educated, it helps. But you don't have to be educated, educated. It's something other. And uh, I mean, the Apostle Paul, who was educated, he had, uh, he was the best of everything. But, uh, and he said, he, you know, he was a Roman of Romans. He was the Hebrew of Hebrews. And, you know, you name it, he was the best at doing it. But he considered it all dong compared to knowing Jesus. And Galatians chapter 1 says, I consider it all dong compared to knowing Jesus. So knowing Jesus was the, the, the priority in his life. That's the priority in my life. Now out of that, the byproduct of that comes prosperity that I can feed somebody else. Every time I pray over food, my wife will tell you, every time I pray over food, I pray that it would multiply so I can feed somebody else. Because prosperity is not having enough for yourself. 
but it's having more than enough for yourself so you can give to somebody else. That's true prosperity. And you know, you don't need a million dollars. You don't need a lot of money to be prosperous. You just need to have the ability to give. A lot of people that in poverty, the millionaires, but they got poverty thinking mind. And so, what is true prosperity is when you can open your purse strings and give without fear. Give in faith. Yeah. Psalm 127 says, Except the Lord build the house, we labour in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman walk, walk, waketh in vain. It is a vain thing, vain, for you to rise up early and to sit up late and to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. And I had to use that scripture to sleep some nights because I've had my mind so filled up with the cares of the world, the cares of other people. I had to use that scripture. And I repent before God right now of sitting up late and getting up early. Jesus looked at me and said, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> but I do it by faith. <laughs> do it by faith. Uh, but I repent of it, and the Lord knows my heart that I have sit up late at night and, you know, write out things like this and the things that we need of. And, and you know, just so I can meet the needs of other people. And uh, so I don't need to make myself look good in front of anybody. I don't need the education to do that. And yet, when I came to Jesus, it was, I was panic if I had to stand up in front of people and talk. And I couldn't do it. Could never do it. And uh, somebody asked me to give a testimony one day and uh, tell, uh, to tell them how I come from the gutter to, to knowing Jesus. And uh, that was the end of it. Once I got the, the anointing on me to preach, I knew that God wanted to use me for the ministry. So we're here today to brainstorm and to come together and brainstorm of how we could do fundraising to meet the people's needs that some people would probably never come to meet them overseas somewhere and uh, there's a lot of Australian givers that uh, they give to charitable organisations because they they don't pay tax on their giving they are tax exempt and so I appeal to people now business people around the world Australia Philippines, India, Pakistan, all those people that can give. And they, you know who I'm talking to. You know who, if you can give. You know if you can meet somebody's need today and you do not do that. If you close, close the bowels of compassion, it says in John, uh, John, sorry, in John, the epistle of John, it says, he who closes up the bells of compassion and does not meet the needs of somebody else. How can the love of God dwell in them? Well, the fact is it doesn't. Simple as that. And you cannot, cannot say that you have the compassion of Jesus in you in close up your bells of compassion because Jesus came to give life and give it more abundantly and he came and give all that he had and then he gave his life for you and for me to come to salvation today. So what will you pay? What will you pay for knowing Jesus? What will you pay to feed the poor? So I ask you today, 
to open up your bowels of compassion and give to those in need. You want to sing for us? Yeah. One, we are one in the Bible of love. Okay. We're going to sing that. We're going to sing that. We're going to sing that.
I'll switch to software. 